I can cross that out as well because okay. I didn't think. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Cabinet this afternoon. Um, I will take us into the uh, agenda, but for, before we do that, we'll just uh, introduce ourselves as cabinet members. So I'm Peter Fox, I'm leader of the council. Phil Murphy, cabinet member for resources. Brian Jones, cabinet member of County Corporations. Paul Jordan, cabinet member of governance. Richard John, cabinet member for children and young people. Sarah Jones, cabinet member for social justice and community development. Penny Jones, cabinet member for so uh, social services, health and safeguarding. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, obviously we're joined today by uh, a lot of officers and visiting members, welcome to you all uh, and, uh, and, and members of the public as well. So welcome to everybody and uh, perhaps if you were involved in the debate officers could you introduce yourselves um, as and when please. Uh, apologies for absence, apologies today from Councillor uh, Bob Greenland um, and uh, apologies from D D Dimitri Petruni and, uh, and Joe Watkins. Nothing from Debbie. and Debbie Blakeborough. Okay. Right, let's move on then. Declarations of interest. Um, are there any declarations by members that could be any members in the room, not just cabinet at this point? If not, if you find one as you go through, can you please uh, verbally declare that and then fill in the appropriate performer from Nicola? And if, if one comes up in the, in the debate, then just do that there and there and then. Okay, so right, let's move on then to item three, and that's to consider um, the 2019-20 Education and Welsh Church Trust Funds Investment and Fund Strategies. Mm -hmm. Councillor Phil Murphy. Yes, thank you, Dean. Um, uh, the purpose of this report is to present uh, to Cabinet this afternoon. Um, the uh, for approval of the 2019-20 investment <coughs> and fund strategy for the trust funds for which the authority acts as sole uh, or custodian trustee for adoption and to approve the 1920 grant allocation to local authority beneficiaries of the Welsh Church Fund. Um, this is a regular report comes uh, before us and the reason for it is that the authority acts as the sole trustee for the Welsh Church Fund and the custodian uh, with regard to the Monmouthshire Farm School Endowment Trust Fund. Uh, so annually we have to approve the investment fund strategies uh, for them. Um, in addition, the Welsh Church Fund um, uh, requires us to determine the grant allocation for the forthcoming year. Um, we uh, fairly regularly uh, uh, put the uh, position of uh, advisor out to uh, tender and we did that in March 16 for four years with an option to extend for two years and that um, successful body was Arling Close uh, and they're the uh, they're the advisors to the account to the council on on everything else as well um, and uh, their, st their strategy is to maintain the security of invested capital maintain sufficient liquidity to allow the grants to be distributed and to ma maintain an optimum yield which is commensurate with uh, security and liquidity. So, um, as I said, uh, Leader, this is um, this is a, a, a report which uh, comes to us on a regular basis. It is quite uh, detailed, but it's basically only renewing the the uh, investment strategy for the uh, oncoming year. All right, many thanks, uh, Phil. Yes, it's something we see every year, quite rightly. We need to understand that investment and fund strategy. Uh, cabinet colleagues, anybody wish to add anything? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, well, I will just read through the recommendations for the um, recognising there may be uh, uh, members looking in um, uh, on the webcast. And so, right, the recommendations, a few of them here, recommendation two, recommendation two one, the proposed investment and fund strategy for 2019-20 for the Monmouthshire Farm School Endowment Trust be approved and that the proposed <coughs> investment and fund strategy 
uh, for the Welsh Church Fund uh, also be approved um, and to de delegate responsibility for the execution administration of treasury management decisions to the head of finance 151 officer who will act in accordance with the investment and fund strategy which is found at appendix 2 to approve the 2019-20 grant allocation to local authority beneficiaries to the Monmouthshire Welsh Church Act Fund of 210,000 to be distributed in accordance with the population shares as per the 2010 census and that the Monmouthshire Farm School Trust Board determines the 2019-20 grant allocation at its October meeting based on the previous year's investment return at the end of March 2018 and any underspends carried forward from 2018-19 grant allocation and to avoid eroding the overall fund and finally to endorse the Welsh Church Fund principles, policy considerations and grant allocation criteria for 2019-20 uh, found at Appendix 6 as considered and approved by the Welsh Church Fund Committee on the 17th of January earlier this year. All in favour of those recommendations? <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. On to uh, the whole authority uh, risk uh, assessment, another report that we have to see annually, indeed we want to see uh, annually. Um, and this is to provide a cabinet with an overview of the current strategic <coughs> risks facing the authority and to seek our approval of the whole authority strategic risk assessment and amendments to the strategic risk assessment policy and its uh, guidance. The strategic risk assessment is, update, uh, uh, is updated based on the latest evidence available in line with the Council's strategic risk management policy. The risk assessment only covers the high and medium level strategic risks. Those lower level risks are, register, are not registered unless they are projected to escalate within the three years uh, covered. The risk assessment is a living document and will evolve over the course of the year as new information comes to light. There have been a number of amendments to the strategic risk register to ensure that it accurately manages the current strategic risks that the council uh, faces and they are outlined in Appendix 1. An internal audit review of the council's strategic risk management arrangements identified that there were a number of areas for improvement and an action plan has been agreed with internal audit to deliver the improvements that are required. Uh, these have been considered in the latest iteration of the strategic risk register. The uh, risk assessment was presented to the audit committee in January uh, this year um, and that fulfilled then the audit committee's role in providing assurance of the adequacy of our risk management strategy. The Strategic Risk Register will be reported to Audit Committee and Cabinet at least annually. The need to consider the risk uh, appetite was also raised uh, during the internal audit report and this has now been reflected in the revised policy. In some circumstances, a degree of risk may be accepted in order that a benefit can be gained or an opportunity taken. Uh, the risk assessment will continue to be subject to continuous review as part of the authority's performance management framework and up-to-date risk <coughs> register is available, uh, accessible rather, to members on the council's internet site. You find it on the hub. This will ensure that all members and select committees uh, are able to uh, use the risk register at any point in the year as their work uh, requires them to. So members, it's uh, pretty straightforward. But now if we move on down to the appendix, you'll see the, the schedule of risks that we've identified through the authority. Um, and you'll see the ownership and, uh, and the, uh, the um, mitigating actions proposed and the progress against those actions, which are highlighted there and the level of risks and uh, uh, as we, we see it and the ownership of those risks. I'm not going to go through all, all of these, and, but you can obviously, members, if you need to speak to any of these uh, of yourself, but you'll see uh, who uh, is um, the owner of these. And you can see also very clearly one which has been brought up in the past and it features as a last risk is now concern around uh, uh, being prepared for um, the, um, uh, the leaving of the European Union. 
and uh, so that's put as a risk assessment and that's something which we we needed to bring forward last year so i'm not proposing to talk us through every risk here but members if you find that one you don't feel you are con you are um, uh, content with the progress that's been made on there or you don't feel that you are the appropriate owner of them uh, please speak up now i don't think that's going to be the case though um so cabinet over to you penny um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to say that, um, you, you know, there, were, there is ongoing improvements and, uh, for instance, the safeguarding audit framework uh, for evaluation SAFE has been rolled out across the Council and the whole authority safeguarding group um, provides excellent leadership. So there are ongoing um, standards going, um, ensuring that safeguarding is, is, safe, is in good hands. Um, we also have a volunteer policy, which was a recommendation that came through from the last audit, um, Welsh audit um, inspection, and um, that's proved to be successful and is again ongoing. So I'm satisfied with the risk of it being put down. I don't know, if Richard, if you feel the same, you're on the same area, but that our vulnerable children and our vulnerable adults are, are being well looked uh, cared for. Just, just to echo, just to echo Penny's comments. Right? Okay. I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, the, 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 I encourage members to keep, keep their eye on the uh, risk register on the on the hub. It is accessible. It's always been there. Uh, a lot of members still struggle to find their way around the hub, but it's uh, an important resource that we have at our. Yeah. Uh, our fingertips and uh, it gives you a flavour of where we need to focus the progress we're making alongside of those things it's always helpful for us to be able to monitor them obviously ourselves as cabinet members but for, for all members to be able to keep abreast of, of the challenges that we're facing and uh, you know an organisation of this size and this complexity will have risk it always has risks this is how we, we are managing and preparing for that risk which is important I believe that uh, um, the reg register gives a, a strong position of where we are. Richard, uh, you're with us today. Anything you wanted to add? I think you covered the main point. We see the boost environment changes, and the assumption of progress, new evidence brought to light, so we continue to update and make sure appropriate time to take care of that. So I'm actually respectfully, we, we, we can. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. And it's, as, as the report says, it's a living document mm -hmm. um, and has to be. Obviously. My colleagues, anybody, anything else? No, okay, right, let's move back to the recommendation. And we'll get there in a second. <coughs> Right, the recommendation then, uh, 2 1, that the Cabinet members approve the strategic risk assessment shown at Appendix 1 as a realistic and evidenced appraisal of the strategic risks, risks facing the authority over the next three years. And 2 2, that Cabinet approve amendments to the strategic risk management policy and guidance as referred to in paragraph 3.6. All in favour of those? Thank you very much. Okay, um, back to the agenda. Right, so uh, now we move on to uh, the uh, um, Richard um, uh, uh, John uh, on the report of the federate uh, report to federate the governing bodies of Flamfoist, Bower, and Flambiango Corny Primary Schools. Richard, thank, thank you, leader. I'll I'll just explain some of the the background to, to this proposal. Um, the head teacher of Lambie Hangle Krikorny um, Primary School, um, Mrs. Davis, retired at the end of the summer last year. And um, in, in fact, there was, we had a, a brilliant um, celebration. It was, it was actually to celebrate the, the 50th anniversary of, of that school. It was, it was in July and it obviously coincided with Mrs. Davis's retirement. It was, it was a brilliant afternoon. And um, uh, one of the things I, I was very keen to, to say to parents, because I think there's often um, you, you can often get concern amongst amongst parents of, um, of children at such a small school. Um, <laughs> Lambie Hangle Kikorni has, has got 63 pupils in it. Um, th th there's naturally concern of, of, about the future, and I, I think part of the um, proposals we're bringing forward today put the leadership of, of that school on a on, on a secure footing for the future. So I was very keen to, to emphasise that we're we're really proud of that school and today's proposals will will put it on a on a secure footing. Um, so it, it can be very difficult to to recruit head teachers for, for very small schools. Um, we're, we're grateful to John Murphy who's who's here today for for um, taking on the role of executive head teacher of both Lanfoyce Primary School and Lambie Hangle Krikorny. 
and we've been really impressed with how well the, this federation has been working and of course it's it's been well documented the the benefits of of school to school working for, for staff but also also for the pupils and if you read the consultation report it's very clear that the benefits that the pupils at both schools feel that they're, they're getting from that really close relationship of, between those <coughs> um, the vast majority of children from those schools progress on to king henry the eighth so new peer groups are being formed as a result of this um, there's, there's a lot of school to school um, sharing of best practice between teachers. And this is the sort of thing we, we really want to encourage. And we were very clear in our corporate plan that we wanted to help drive up standards of leadership, that we recognize that a critical factor in determining how successful a school is, is the strength of leadership. Um, and we've, we're lucky to have some really, some really excellent head teachers in Monmouthshire, but we want to keep them. Um, having executive head positions gives head teachers somewhere to go to in ensuring that they've got career progression. Um, we also want to be able to attract the brightest and best head teachers to Monmouthshire. So being able to offer that career progression, I think is really important. Um, but as, as is clear in the consultation document, there are a, a number of benefits, um, including to, to Lambie Hangul Krikorni, where um, perhaps a, a year group of five or six pupils now face greater opportunities because they can do things together with with, with children in, in the year group in um, in Land Foist. So I'm, I'm sure John Murphy may have some perspectives he'd like to share with us and I would like to put on record my my thanks to John. Um, it's it's been really impressive seeing how you've you've led this significant change for both schools and um, I, I think this has really shown us how um, we can in, uh, how we can um, make these significant changes and it's something we, we may wish to look at in, in, in other areas as it's been so successful and we're seeing significant benefits for both schools. So thank you for what you've done and I'm um, really interested yeah. to hear your, your yeah. perspective on it. Yeah, th and, and welcome John, I'm really, really pleased to, to, you're here. So yeah, if you could, if you want to share some perspectives on it, that'd be really great. Absolutely. Um, can I put on record my thanks for the opportunity to be able to lead this first hard federation, or proposed federation to the authority, because I feel that we're setting up a model, if it's agreed, that will be something that we can all emulate successfully in the future for other schools. Um, first of all, you, you cited 63 pupils We've gone up to 70 since then, oh, wow. so I think that it's begin, beginning to attract other people on board. Um, can I just put it into context? My first head chip, I'm in my fourth head chip. My first was at Landogo in the Y Valley, and there are lots of parallels. There were 70 pupils there, three teachers as there are in Lambie Hangel, and it was the hardest job I've ever had. It was extremely difficult because of capacity. I was teaching four days a week. I had the responsibility for six curriculum areas, Elenco, and it was really, really tough. So when I went into this executive headship, I thought, what am I letting myself in for? Because I've got all that to look forward to again. But the way that it's structured and worked, it, that hasn't been the case. It's been one of the most delightful experiences of my career. It's been really enjoyable. Um, we took advice on executive headships from an executive head before we set it up. And it nearly put the governing body off because the executive head who we invited in talked about it being a strategic role and that she didn't attend assemblies, didn't attend concerts, didn't meet with parents, that there were head teachers in place, <coughs> uh, sorry, assistant heads in place, and that was their role. Well, to be honest, that's not what headship's about. Headship's about children and meeting with children. So the model that we've set up is a high visibility model for the head teacher. I'm in both schools, both days. I spend half a day in each school. I was worried initially, is that doable? Yes, it is. Does it work? Yes, it does, because I'm on the school gate either in the morning or at the end of the day. So I still have that high visibility headship. And that's exactly what 
parents want to see. So if we talk about succession planning for this model, that high visibility headship and not just the strategic is really, really important for making it work. Um, funding, a lot of it's about viability and sustainability for the future for the small school. The school had, for the first year, reached a £511 surplus, which you only needed two people away, <laughs> one person away two days, and, and your budget was wiped out. Um, we're looking towards the end of this year of £15,000 surplus, and that will carry on growing with the model that we've got and the business plan that's in place. So already it's becoming a viable financial operation, which before it wasn't. The concerns of stakeholders, particularly the parents, were was the head teacher present? Are we going to see the head teacher or are they just going to place themselves in an office? That automatically has been taken, uh, that worry has gone for parents. Huge benefits, economies of scale. Um, <coughs> There is something that, that I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's called the Excellence in Teaching and Leadership Framework. It's an ele electronic tool for monitoring standards in school. And the Education Achievement Service see that as pivotal to us raising standards. There's a cost to it. And Lambie Hangel Krikorny couldn't defy, afford to buy that model. We've piggybacked them onto Landfoist. It hasn't cost us any. And now we've got a viable monitoring tool in place. And that's just one example of how things have um, improved. Staff sharing of expertise. Uh, we've got one additional learning needs coordinator across both schools. We've got one being and well uh, equity coordinator. The, with the new curriculum that's coming in, there are six new areas of learning and experience. That would mean two areas for each teacher in a small school. We place them into Land Foist team. So now they've got access to an additional seven teachers and, and expertise. Um, so the staff don't feel that they're overloaded. Their work-life balance has been addressed and they've got a lot of their life back because we're sharing planning, sharing policies um, and sharing expertise. One of the joys of being a teacher or a head teacher is music and listening to children sing every day. That's a privilege that, that's absolutely amazing. In Lambie Angle Krikorny, there's no live music there at all, it's all recorded. Um, we've had the music coordinators come over to play for our Steadfords, for assemblies, for concerts, and that has lifted that profile in school enormously. Might sound minor, it's not, it's major in school life music. Lambie Hangel children unfortunately had never been to a pantomime outside of school because of the costs. Uh, they, were, they went for the first time this year because we combined the costs of the coaches and the tickets, brought the prices right down so they had their first pantomime visit. Uh, they are going on their first residential visit this year to London, which again, with 11 pupils, they just couldn't afford it because the cost was so high. Uh, we've had combined sports in addition to all the curriculum sports. And with that, we haven't had land foist against Landy Handel and Corny. We pick and mix the teams. So it's been a great experience. Instead of 11 friends, and we touched on this, going up to the secondary school, as they say, small fish into a big pond, they now have an additional 30 friends from Land Voice. So that transition is a lot easier as well. Um, we are monitored rigorously and externally by the Education Achievement Service. And this year we put our hands to take, up, uh, take part in a, a peer evaluation. So we were monitored by three head teachers and two education achievement service officers. And both schools came out as categorised green, meaning that they need minimum support. And I think that again validates how sharing that expertise can raise standards and maintain standards in both schools. You mentioned succession planning. I 
as a head teacher if I was in the market. It is an upward move and I think it will attract high calibre people and um, recruitment in headship is difficult in this day and age. I don't think it would be difficult for federation. So just to round that, that up very briefly, I think federation has worked, it's been incredibly smooth. I know that um, Cathal Nunch mentioned in a moment, there wasn't one objection from any stakeholders, including unions, parents, teachers, um, Welsh government. So all in all, uh, I think it's been a wonderful experience and a very viable model to go forward with. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I would love to. If I could just thank you, John, that was absolutely fantastic to, to hear your, your perspective. And I mean, to have a consultation on absolutely anything and not have uh, a single stakeholder object yeah. shows just how yeah, compelling that, that, really that case good. is. And I, I really must pay, pay tribute and, and to the staff that worked with you for the fantastic job you've all been doing. And for both schools to be given green status mm -hmm. is at, at a period of what you what you would think of as significant structural change is 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 really incredible. Um, so you know, thank thank you for what you're doing and to, to hear about the opportunities that those children are now enjoying, opportunities that weren't open to them before. And you know, maybe maybe some of these children are um, maybe their parents don't have the money to take them to, to the, the pantomime themselves. That may be the first time in their lives they've been to the to the pantomime. Um, so to hear that those opportunities are being opened up yeah. is, is, yeah. is really heartwarming. Yeah. And yeah, once again, thank you, thank you, John. Thanks for coming along, but thanks for giving us that. It gives us those assurances. The federating model we've talked about many years and we sort of never quite got there because there's another group to thanks as well. I mean, the governors for... Uh, wanting I, I would imagine you know to get governors to come together is a is a big thing you know they're very proud of their schools and to actually to um to share that to give up some sovereignty and to come together and work together is is a, is a credit to them as well both governing bodies to to enable that that to happen. Uh, I think what you captured it perfectly, the, the benefits, the economies of scale, how they, the, how, how they can be shared and benefit the, the smaller uh, of the partnership. And I think that's just uh, just great. So, you know, um, it's really helpful having that experience if we do feel there's uh, an opportunity to, to uh, take this further in some areas in the council. I think I've got a lot of confidence out of what I've heard today and uh, through the results of, of the consultation process. So uh, uh, thank you, John. Um, if anyone's going to make it happen, it would be you because you're a fantastic head teacher. So, uh, thank you again. Right, colleagues, anybody want to add anything? Well, just briefly, um, I've, I've been a chief education officer here twice for, for, for short periods of time, but, but a longer period of time elsewhere. Um, and to work with head teachers and governors who are committed to children is, I think, the highest privilege actually in public service today it was then it, it continues to be and, and he's here so i'll say something kind to him john is probably one of the strongest and best heads i've ever worked with and because he finds a way and he does it with a style that suits context as indeed did your wife uh, when, when we had the privilege of having isabel working in, in our schools also um, it's it's delightful that John's just agreed to pop his retirement for another decade and, uh, <laughs> and, and stay put. Um, but the the point I wanted to make was this, uh, and sometimes we we can lose sight of this. I, I've always seen head teachers as an extension of our leadership team. Being a head teacher can be an incredibly lonely position. Uh, John and I work with heads at the same time who, who've not been having the best of times, haven't we really? And having a sense of belonging and attachment both to your school but to something that's wider and bigger at times is, is really important and it would be remiss of me not to take the opportunity just to register just how significant John has been to Monmouthshire as a whole, not just to the schools that you've worked in, um, but, but to, to schools and to head teachers that come to you as they do to, to, to some others. So I think this federation is fantastic. I think there are lessons that we can be learning from it for the future. It's got something to do with bespoke thoughtfulness and remembering what really matters. 
federations are not technical processes. They're as much about cultural alignment as it is they are about anything else. I've got great confidence in this in this particular example. And I think John's point about in time, this being the sort of opportunity that the very best primary head teacher is going to want to gravitate towards is incredibly important. Thank you, thank you, thank you Paul. Absolutely. Yeah, please come back in, John. Yeah. Very, very remiss of me not to mention Kath, because Kath has done all the groundwork and the proposals and the work and well McLean as well. They've been exemplary and the partnership has been absolutely fabulous between local authority and the schools. So thank you. Oh, sorry. Thanks for sharing that, John. Well done, Kath. Will, no, you're tough. You're missing out on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, well, it, yeah, it, 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 was a, uh, it was great to receive that report then. So there's uh, uh, colleagues, anybody else? No, no. Okay, let's let's go back to the recommendation then. And uh, so, so we now need to formalise the, the the process really, and that's what the recommendation is asking us to do. So we, we suppose it's almost been a pilot, I suppose. Is it? I'm not sure what we call it, pilot, I suppose. So anyway, the recommendation of two one is that members consider the consultation report in appendix one. We now have been already referenced, and it's a really po really positive. And uh, and for us to agree to federate the governing bodies of Lanfoys Vower and Llanviangel Cocorny Primary Schools with effect from the 1st of September 2019 and in line with the reasons stated within this report. Are we all in favour to support that? Great, thanks very much. That's great. John, thanks very much. You, you're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. But, uh, I've got two schools to run. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going too fast now. Um, Okay, so uh, those of you who are on uh, Modgo, I think we'll need to, yeah, you need to exit the report and pick up the following uh, report. So the so next item is, uh, is for us to, to uh, um, uh, receive the proposal to consult on the closure of Mountain House Special School. And as, as I said, that's in a, in a separate cover. So let's pick that up uh, now. Cabinet, cabinet, cover yeah, that was, that was, that's the one, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, again, um, uh, Richard John, this is your report. Thank you. Um, we've been undertaking an extensive review of additional learning needs and the, the support we can provide as a local authority for our most vulnerable children. Um, part of that has been looking at the role of, I mean, key to that really has been the, the role of Mountain House and um, the, I, I suppose, narrow provision that, that, that it provides at the moment in terms of the uh, overall needs of, of children and young people in, in Monmouthshire, given um, the, the fact it, it only has provision for boys, it's only provision for children aged between, six, between 11 and 16. Um, so last year we consulted on proposals um, to uh, reconfigure Mountain House and to expand the range of services on, on offer so that it can provide um, support to both boys and girls from the age of seven up to 16 or perhaps even to, up to 19. Um, we were very keen to perhaps widen the range of, of support at Mountain House for children with social, emotional and behavioural difficulties and also children with autistic spectrum disorder. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the capital costs associated with that, um, it was concluded that they would be in excess of £6 million, which was significantly more than, um, than, than we had budgeted for. Um, so in this consultation, we're, we're looking again at the future of, of Mountain House, and because we, we feel due to its current designation, it's too narrowly focused on, on boys and children of a secondary school age. Um, we feel it's unable to meet the needs of many of our <coughs> children with additional learning needs and um, with, with, with vulnerabilities. Um, we currently have five Monmouthshire children um, at Mountain House, and that's due to fall to four children from um, four pupils from September. Um, so we're, we're launching this this consultation, and we will we will look very carefully at, at, at the responses and. Um, we will have a significant responsibility to um, determine how we can best provide for our most vulnerable children. Um, but I'm afraid this does raise very real questions about whether um, Mountain House is providing the best possible provision for those five, um, soon to be four, Monmouthshire um, pupils. 
and we'll also need to consider um, the the costs. Um, we we are looking at um, close to a quarter of a million pounds spend per pupil from September, and we do need to ask ourselves whether we can provide better, more bespoke support for those pupils um, for for the amount of money we're we're spending. Um, we have a duty to to taxpayers, but most of all to our most vulnerable children that we provide the very best support we can for them. Okay, thank you, thank you, Richard. Um, and obviously, yes, we move, proposing to move uh, out this uh, consultation document. So uh, there's a lot of people to talk to. It'd be really interesting to uh, um, get the feedback from um, not only uh, parents, but other authorities, because uh, other authorities for many, many years have been using, um, using Mountain House. I remember uh, when I was a cabinet member for education back in 2000 and um, one and two, you know, that was, that's when uh, the, the, the school had uh, a lot of young people there from uh, many authorities. And um, as we've had to alter uni costs and different things over the years, we've seen, uh, uh, and as uh, pressure built in other authorities, we saw the number of children reducing um, over that period come into the school. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was hopeful that there may be a solution for Mountain House, which may have been all encompassing of different types of provision for different genders and uh, and, and lots of things. But I think that uh, we cannot we cannot be blind to the, the, the capital costs as well of this. So, um, and it is a sobering <laughs> message when we we hear that uh, you know we will have four of our young. Uh, people there and um, you know to continue that provision as it is at the moment would be in the region of a million pounds each. Now I have to ask myself is that the best for those young people and is, is, is are we doing the, the right thing by our our uh, residents of, uh, of, of Monmouthshire? I think your point on having bespoke solutions to the individual needs of those most vulnerable children is fundamental that's got to be our first and foremost consideration um and and so you know i'm absolutely confident there will be solutions i know you've identified in the report uh, the costs uh, the unit costs for, for supporting similar type schools um which, which uh, are nearby um so you know and i hope i hope the uh, other authorities, you know, um, uh, they give some consideration of how, in the event of anything happening with this school, how they might be providing and preparing for the young people uh, which are in their care, but we are uh, currently uh, educating, you know, so, so um, I, nobody welcomes reports like this because it's, uh, it's a, a, a <coughs> something nobody really wants to have to look at. But at times there is a responsibility on us as, a, as a, an LEA um, on behalf of the learners and future generations of learners that we do have to consider the best provision moving forward for those nature of those young people uh, of, uh, going forward and, and obviously to, to use what limited resources we have in the best way. So um, um, I um, uh, recognise the importance of of needing to consult on this report, and I'm happy to support the recommendation. Colleagues, any? Um, yes, Chair. I'm very sad that it's come to this. I, I, you know, there are all sorts of reasons, and I, I perhaps shouldn't have come to this, but we are where we are, and we have to go forward and, and be sensible. And uh, you know, we we've, we've got to make the right recommendations. And all I would ask is that you can guarantee, Richard, that appropriate provision and educational opportunities are given to the four. Who are going to be left from from Monmouthshire? Because I think that's so important. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it it is sad, and I you know I must pay tribute to the the staff of Mountain House who have, have been on a journey really in the in the past few years. You know, the school fell into a, a red category. It was put into uh, significant improvement by by Estin, and if, in fact, the school's made significant strides yeah, forward yes. since then. Yeah. Um, I attended a number of the education improvement board meetings with with EAS and officers from Monmouthshire and you know the, the school has, has has improved significantly you know it's now in a in a, in a yellow category um, but it's got to be the needs of the pupils that that come first and you're absolutely right we need to make sure that the provision we have for those four um, there's five or soon to be four 
uh, vulnerable children is, is the best for them. Yeah, we used to, thank you, Rita, we used to um, have significant support from other authorities, as Rita mentioned just now. And, uh, it's not just the fact that we, that we would only have four of our own children there, is that there's the distinct lack of children being, being offered to us uh, by uh, other authorities as well. Um, and if, if they're not prepared to send the children there, therefore we miss out on the opportunity of recovering costs in that way, uh, then inevitably it, it, uh, it causes us substantial difficulties ourselves. So uh, uh, it's, it's a pity because uh, clearly if there was a demand from other authorities that, that made the facility viable, we wouldn't be in the position we are now, but there's not. Richard, uh, what provision do we currently make for girls with additional learning needs within the mission? Um, so there's, there's, there's a range of, um, of, of different provision and for, for those um, Monmouthshire children, um, if, if we do proceed with, with the closure, um, there'll be a number of options we can consider that, that are available to, um, to girls at the moment. So um, we, could, we could consider places at um, Headland School, we could consider um, in-county provision, there, there may be additional support we can we can provide so that obviously we've, we've been very clear that we we would like children to remain in county as close to their home communities as possible so um, it, it basically means for this very narrow group of boys aged between 11 and 16 we'd be looking at some alternative provision which is already on offer to, to girls to, to boys who don't fit into that age category um, but Obviously, we'll, we'll need to um, look at what provision is best for that individual pupil um, because it's, it's, it's vital we, we provide the, the very best support we, we can, but um, let's, yeah. you know, let's, let's listen to the findings of the consultation and, and, and go from there. But there, there, there are options, which, yeah. but we need to look at it on a um, per pupil basis. Key thing, like this is a consultation. Let's listen mm -hmm. to what it's got to yeah. say, and uh, you know, make sure that it's it's well. I know it's a statutory consultation, so it'll need there's a broad set of consultees which we may need to make sure. And we must encourage them to take part in this. Uh, our neighbouring authorities and, and uh, stakeholders who you you use this, I'm sure they'll be willing to uh, uh, to to get, to get involved. So, uh, how long is the process? Let's just say in this somewhere the process now. So consultation six, six weeks. Okay. Um, and there'll be various meetings conducted with uh, the various stakeholders, users, pupils, uh, governors, and um, and others. Okay, great. Uh, officer, sorry, yeah, um, um, anybody want to add anything further to what Richard, what we spoke about? Nikki, any of um, Jackie or, or Matt? I think really it's just to, to echo what you said, uh, Chair, in the fact that it's, um, it is a consultation. Um, there are lots of, lots of stakeholders that will be involved in the consultation. And we will come back with all of the quality yeah. results to you to make a decision following that. So we're looking at uh, a date in May time, is it something like that? June. June, June is a June. Right. Okay. Then. Okay, anybody else anything they wish on? No? Okay, so let's see. It's a simple recommendation. The recommendation for us is to agree to consult on the closure of Mountain House Special School. Are we all in favour to do that? Yes, that's unanimous. Okay, and um, we look forward to to um, to, to um, uh, hearing back from all of that in, in June. Okay, so let's move on then to um, the back to the agenda. Okay. Um, and I think that that leads leads us to the end of the public uh, meeting. And uh, before we go on to the next item, I'll be required to uh, uh, let me just get log on to the next item. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. So uh, we, we we're going to be moving into uh, consider a, a report from the investment committee. Um, so I now need to uh, um, formally uh, move, ask somebody to move that we exclude press and public. Can somebody formally do that? Moved, seconded, seconded, yes. So uh, we are now in.